What's going on everyone? It's Ben from YGO from Zero back with another Yugi Kaiba format video. Now I know I said in my last video that was potentially going to be my last Exodia video, but you know I received a list, a deck list from a Discord user in the format library named Oreki, and I think it's really really cool and I think it's actually solves a lot of the problems that I was bringing up when, you know, testing out the sort of soul side deck strategy. So I wanted to show it off because I do think it is potentially the best way to play Exodia in this format. Now, I say it's the best way to play Exodia in the format, but one thing you'll notice is that we don't actually have Exodia in the main deck. No. We start out on a pretty heavy soul control package. And then in game two, or potentially three, if our opponent sides in a bit more aggressively, you know, maybe into worm control to combat our heavy soul control strategy, then we bring in Exodia. Because decks like worm control or decks that are not playing soul exchange and soul control can have a tough time against stall decks like Exodia. So you can often win games, you know, by basically mind gaming your opponent into siding into a bad matchup for Exodia. I think this has a couple advantages to playing Exodia in the main deck. If you play Exodia in the main deck, game one you're on Exodia, but games two and three you basically have to be on whatever's in your side deck because if you win with Exodia, then your opponent will know what's up and side in some card destructions or things like that to deal with your strategy. But this way, you know, you can play game one as heavy soul control deck. If you so choose, you can play game two as a heavy soul control deck as well. Like if you're up against stall mill, soul control does pretty good against that deck. So you might want to keep it on soul control. You know, if they side into a sort of inferior standard aggro build, then you can still potentially win against them with this soul control deck. But it gives you options and it makes you much more likely to win against stall mill than a typical Exodia deck would allow. But if you win one game with soul control and you think your opponent might side into something to counter this strategy in particular, you can just side into Exodia and potentially just get a free win in game two and just quickly 2-0 the opponent. So I think this is a really awesome deck that does solve Exodia's main problems. So before I show this off in a duel, let's just dive into the deck breakdown. Now as a note, this is Oreki's original deck list. I haven't made any changes to it. So there are some things that you know I might quibble about here and there, maybe say that you should maybe ch switch out a card or two for another card or two. But I think in general, this is a perfectly acceptable deck list. And, you know, it's potentially better than whatever changes that I would make. Oreki did originate this deck, and they've won with it more than I have. So they're probably a bit more trustworthy on what the deck layout should actually be. But anyways, the deck breakdown. We have three Summon Skull, two Judge Man to pair with three Soul Exchange, one Change of Heart. Yes, you know, this does mean that there will be one tribute monster in the deck that you can't really cheat out by using one of your opponent's monsters, but it does mean that, like, your change of hearts and your soul exchanges will be online more of the time, so you'll be more likely to actually be able to pull off that combo, less likely to brick. Also, having a fifth tribute monster in the deck can have some sort of niche applications with things like ultimate offering. If you summon out a monster, your opponent trap holds it, you can bring out a tribute monster with ultimate offering to dodge around that trap hole. So having a fifth tribute monster in the deck isn't actually that bad and can actually be quite good. In addition to the tribute monsters, we're playing three lodge ins, three battle oxes. We don't have three Neos here because there isn't quite the deck space, but this is a pretty good aggressive core, and given that we've got so many tribute monsters that we can easily bring out, we don't really need any more 1700 beaters. We also have three Aquamador, three Giant Soldiers of Stone, having a bit more of a defensive presence in the deck 
Having a bit more of a defensive presence in the deck can enable you to draw into your combo more easily. It can also cause your opponent to use up things like reinforcements or fissures on weaker monsters and then have less ways to out things like Summon Skull or Judge Man. We also have three man your bug, which is just an all around great card. It's removal on your opponent's turn potentially, and you can bring it out with something like ultimate offering, which can be very, very good. For the spells, we are playing Change of Heart, Dark Hole, Monster Reborn, Pot of Greed, Raigeki, you know, the power five limited spells, because they're just all great. Especially, you know, Change of Heart in this deck is super, super good as it's basically always a form of removal. We're also playing three Fisher, just more removal, pretty great. We're playing three Soul Exchange, as I mentioned before, to pair with our five Tribute Monsters. And we're playing two Swords of Dealing Light, just a general great card in the format, allows you to stall to draw into your combo it, at times when you might not have it. It can also prematurely trigger things like Man Your Bug or something like that, if you so wish. It can flip up Monsters for Fisher, just an all around great card. And lastly, for the traps, we have three trap holes, three Wobokus. Trap holes are great at removal on your opponent's turn. Wobokus are great at protecting your monsters and your life points. You'll notice that we don't have three reinforcements here. The reason for that is, since we're playing so many tribute monsters, we can rely on their beefy attack stats instead of, you know, a trap card to boost our weaker monsters' attack stats. So that's why we cut the reinforcements here. You could maybe add some in but I don't really think that it's necessary. Uh, Oreki clearly didn't think that they were necessary, and I agree with them. And lastly, we have one ultimate offering. This is great at, you know, dodging around trap hole, as I said, but also as a defensive measure, you know, if your opponent clears your board, you can set out a defender or a man in your bug, or, you know, bring out something like a lodge in even to block an attack. So ultimate offering, very good card. It's not essential to this deck, so that's why it's only at one, but it also does help post siding, as I'll get into in a second. As a note, we have three Guy the Dragon Champion in the extra deck. This doesn't actually come into play in the deck itself, but having an extra deck can be nice at, you know, weirding out your opponent for a bit, the mind games before the game even starts. They might question, oh, are they on, like, Metal Dragon? Are they on Guy of the Dragon Champion? Are they on a Fusion deck at all? Or is it just a bluff? Who knows? So, you know, the extra decks here, not really strictly necessary, but it can give you a slight edge in some cases. More importantly, the side deck. We have all five pieces of Exodia for our smokescreen side. We have three Mystical Elf, three Spirit of the Harp to bump up our defender total to allow us to stall even longer. We have two Wall of Illusion. Again, more walls allow us to stall longer. And then we have two Ultimate Offering. These are here to ensure that we draw Ultimate Offering as early as possible. I actually feel like you could honestly cut one Ultimate Offering and put in another Defender because Exodia, you really don't want a brick as much as possible because you've got five bricks already in the deck. So I, you know, I do think that drawing ultimate offering as early as possible is important, but I feel like having a defender in this slot is better long-term because you don't want to be drawing multiple ultimate offerings late in the game when you really need a defender. So if I was to make one change with this deck, that's the change that I would make. But I think that, you know, including an extra ultimate offering is also perfectly valid because if you can get it online earlier in the game than you otherwise might be able to, you can save more life points early on potentially. So perfectly reasonable thing to do. But now that you've seen the deck, let's see how it plays in some games. Okay, we've got a game against GGBO789, who you may remember from a previous video on the channel. They're a great duelist in the format. They have a very unique deck that I am planning on showing off on the channel later on that they may actually be playing in this game here. We'll have to wait and see. But let's dive into it. They managed to win the Rock, Paper, Scissors, so they will be going first here. And 
And this isn't the worst hand to start out with. Oh, I should hide. I, you know, I like just showing one player's hand because I feel like it sort of gives more insight into why I'm making the plays that I'm making. But if a lot of people feel strongly about it, you know, uh, I could change it to showing both players' hands. I just prefer showing one hand at a time. Uh, but let me know in the comments what you think. Anyways, they're going to pass back to us with a Neo and two sets. We've got an Aquamator, so we can defend against that a bit. We'll just set three and pass. They're going to bring out another Neo. We're not going to trap hole that. Uh, maybe we should have, but we'll see. Looks like they don't have a reinforcements, so we're feeling pretty good about that. We draw another Aquamator. Now, we've got a Woboku up, so if they do manage to clear our Aquamator, we can just use the Woboku. And setting an Aquamator could just play into a Raigeki or something like that. So there's debate over whether we should set it or not. That's what we're thinking about here. We're just going to pass. I think maybe we should have just set it because Raigeki is a one of in their deck, and they're not going to dark hole this board most likely. So maybe we should have just set it to play around Fisher or something. But they're going to bring out a Wall of Illusion. They are going to Fisher away our Aquamator, and we will be forced to Woboku this. So not the best. Drawing a Judgment to pair with our Soul Exchange and Change of Heart is very nice. They, we've got a bit of a decision here, though. So a couple options. We could Change of Heart one of their Neos, attack into the other Neo, clear them that way, set an Aquamator, play a bit defensively. However, if they have like a Woboku or Reinforcements, that'll just cause us to lose the Neo. It's still a one-for-one -one trade for one of their cards, but it's not necessarily the best. Uh, we could, you know, Soul Exchange their, one of their monsters, bring out Judgeman. We could Change of Heart one of their monsters, bring out Judgeman and attack. Uh, there's a lot of different options. We have a Swords of the Light in case they're, they manage to like trap Hole or Judgeman or something. I don't know. There, there are different options here. In hindsight, I think maybe it would have actually been best to change of heart one of their Neos, attack into their other Neo. You know, worst case scenario, they use up like a trap and we lose the Neo. We can set the Aqua Matter. They likely won't be able to get over it if they use something like reinforcements. I don't know. It's tough to say. So we think a lot about this. We are just going to change of heart their Neo, tribute off a Judgment. They will trap hole that, but we've got swords to protect our life points for a bit. They're going to switch wall to defense. We draw Fisher, which is okay, but not really right now. We set the Aquamator, pass back to them, or they pass back to us. Reborn's pretty good. Uh, we can bring back Judgment if we so choose. We don't really need to do it yet though. They're going to set another pass back to us. Summon Skull is an okay draw. We're just going to Soul Exchange away their Battle Ox. They're going to Trap Hold that Summon Skull. But honestly, we got removal in, so that's not the worst. We do have a Monster Reborn to bring back this Skull later. They're going to attack in. And they will just take 300 again. So they're going to set one pass back to us. Giant Soldier Stone is a decent draw. We're just going to bring back Summon Skull here. We attack into the Neo. Uh, I think there's definitely an argument to be made for just attacking into the wall. This sort of plays around uh, mass board removal. Uh, you know, we get some skull back in hand to combo with some soul exchanges or change of hearts later on. So I definitely think that there are other things that we could have done here. But anyways, we attack into the Neo. I don't think it's the worst thing in the world. I just think that it's not the best. They're going to bring out a Battle Ox. We will just trap hole this, figuring that they probably have something like a Raigeki or something. So they switch wall to defense. We will just Fisher away the wall to keep the Summon Skull on field. And we'll attack in. Now you could argue that we should save the Fisher for later. But, you know, if they do have mass board clear, we do have a defender to bring out afterwards. And they're unlikely to, you know, kill us if they do manage to clear our board, so. They reborn Judgeman, which is a bit unfortunate because they're able to clear the Aquamator, Fisher away our Summon Skull, and now we're in a rough spot because now we can't actually defend against their monsters. So what we're gonna do here, 
We're going to set the battle ox because we figure, you know, we're going to lose whatever we set anyways. And we want to potentially save Giant Soldier of Stone for later if we do manage to clear the Judge Man to have a defensive presence that they'll have a tough time getting over. They're going to bring out Lodge in, attack into our set, attack us directly. We'll take 18 here. Pass back to us. Dark Hole is a great draw. We'll be able to Dark Hole their entire board away. Set the Giant Soldier, pass back to them. Uh, you could argue maybe we should have just attacked in, figuring they might not have another monster in hand. But that's a bit greedy, I think, especially given that Giant Soldier of Stones are our only monster that we can play. So they're going to Swords it, bring out Lodge in, Fisher away our Giant Soldier, and manage to get in for 18. But that means that they've used up all three Fisher, which is pretty nice to see. We have a Fisher of our own, so we're just going to play it, clear the Lodge in, pass back to them. They're going to bring a wall, just keep the offensive pressure going. We'll take a thousand from that. And Battle Ox is pretty good. Uh, we have a couple options here. We can just summon it. That could play into a trap hole, but they've already used up two trap holes, so they might not have another. Uh, we could just set it because wall only has a thousand life points, but they do, if they do manage to draw another beater, they could just attack over it. So I think just, they're just summoning it is the way to go. They don't have a fissure, so they can't clear it that way. They're going to switch wall to defense, pass back to us. Giant Soldier is a pretty good draw. We don't really feel the need to set it because, you know, it's unlikely that they're going to use something like a Raigeki on Battle Ox. They do have a Battle Ox of their own, so they'll attack in, clear the Battle Ox, and attack in for a thousand. So we're pretty low life points, but honestly, you know, it's not the worst spot, especially drawing that trap hole is very nice. They've used up their Reborn, so we're feeling pretty good about that. Now, we're debating here because we could just summon out the Giant Soldier Stone, attack into the wall, get the Giant Soldier Stone back, potentially, uh, and manage to clear one of their monsters. However, that's a bit risky. If they do have a reinforcements on the field, then we'd just lose our Giant Soldier Stone, and they'd be able to attack in for free next turn. So, I think what we're going to do, we're just going to set it, and that was a mistake. We misclicked there. Uh... I, I don't think it will matter that much. They know we have Trap Hole, but uh, eh, not the worst. They draw Pot of Greed, and they're going to shuffle their hand up a bit, thinking about what to do. They're just going to set one, switch Wall to Defense, pass back to us. We draw an Aquamador, which you know isn't the best, but it's not the worst. They've only used up two Trap Holes, so potentially we could just summon out Judgment, attack into Wall. But we're not going to risk it. We're just going to pass back to them. They're going to set another pass back to us. Lodgin ain't bad, but it doesn't really do anything for us here. We're going to flip up Giant Soldier. And we are going to attack into their set in case it's like Man Eater or something. It's just an Aquamador. We're going to set one pass back to them. They're going to bring out Worm Beast. We're just going to trap hole that. They know we have trap hole already, so... We might as well force them to actually use up an actual removal card to clear the giant soldier. They're going to attack in with the wall and reinforcements to get over giant soldier. But they've used up reinforcements to clear that, so I'm honestly not too torn up about that. We're going to flip up Aquamador. And we are going to attack into the wall. They're going to Woboku that, but we're going to set a card trying to bluff that we have Aquamador set. Uh, you know, maybe they'll think that it's Aquamador and either, you know, not attack into it, or they'll attack into it with just two monsters in the field, naming links to Man Eater Bug. Uh, or they'll do this, which is very unfortunate. They're able to force us to have to pop uh, one of their Aquamador or Giant Soldier of Stone. Um... But I guess the bluff kind of worked, you know. Uh, but Trap Hole is just too little too late here. That ain't going to do it for us. So that will unfortunately be the end of game one. I think there were definitely some moments that I could have played differently that could have led to a different outcome here. And, you know, it's tough to say. But I think that first game could have really gone either way. So... 
I'm not the most experienced with this sort of very heavy soul control deck, so I think there are definitely some things I could have done differently. But that's game one. Uh, hopefully, seeing that you know we're on a sort of soul control, a heavy soul control strategy, they'll try and side in to accommodate that. We already saw that they were on wicked worm beasts, so maybe they'll you know side in more into that strategy, side out some of their tribute monsters. It's tough to say. We will see in game two because we are going to side into Exodia. As a note, uh, I mentioned in the deck breakdown that, you know, I'd, I don't really like three ultimate offerings in an Exodia deck that much. So I did keep in a Lodge in instead of one of the ultimate offerings. Uh, so if you do see Lodge in pop up, if you're trying to consider what the game would have gone like, if that was an ultimate offering, you can just imagine an ultimate offering in its place. But besides that, we sided out all the Lodgings except for one. We sided out all the Battle Oxes, all the Tribute Monsters, all the Soul Exchanges. And we sided in, you know, an extra Ultimate Offering, Defenders, and the Exodia pieces. So let's see how it goes in Game 2. This is a pretty good hand. We have Ultimate Offering right off the bat. Uh, we'll just be able to set three, set an additional one, pass back to them. They'll set four pass back to us. Uh, we're not too torn up about that. We're going to flip up the Giant Soldier of Stone to attack. And we are just going to attack in. Now, you could argue that this is, you know, why are you doing this? You're a stall deck. You should try and stall for a bit longer. But we want to clear it if it's a man-eater bug. And if it's not, we can always fish it away if we so choose. Uh, we're not going to do that, though. Because Aquamador can't get over Giant Soldier. Uh, we do have Ultimate Offering to bring out another monster during their battle phase. But looks like they're on a bit of a slower strategy themselves. We're going to Fisher away their Aquamador and attack in. Again, you might wonder why I'm doing this. Because this is a stall deck, right? Uh, I'm sort of trying to give the illusion that this might actually be an aggressive deck at this point and that we haven't sided into something like Exodia, maybe that will cause them to misplay a little bit. I don't know. Uh, we'll see if it pays off for us in the end, or if it's a grievous error. We do have Swords, we do have Woboku, we do have Ultimate Offering. So if they do manage to go super aggressive here, uh, we do have ways to recover from this. But they're just going to set another pass back to us. We're going to switch the Giant Soldier to Defense now, because we don't have a Fisher. Uh, this time, they're going to Pot of Greed, and they're going to pass back to us. We draw another Aquamator. We don't need to do anything here. Uh, we're fine with this game state. They're going to set another pass back to us. There's that extra Lodgin. So, you know, if that wasn't a Lodgin, it would be an ultimate offering. But we already had an ultimate offering, so uh, wouldn't have actually mattered this game. They're just going to set another pass back to us. We draw a second piece, which is pretty good. They're going to flip up a Giant Soldier, they're going to flip up an Aquamador, and they're going to flip up Maneater, popping our Giant Soldier. They're going to try and attack in, we have Ultimate Offering, so we'll just be able to set a Defender here. They're going to take 700. You could argue that we should have brought out Lodge in with it, uh, because they might not have a Trap Hole at this point, but eh, we're just going to go for a Defender. Why mess with the Classics? We're going to set a Trap Hole, pass back to them. They're going to change of heart, our Aquamator. Uh, and here we're going to Waboku. We could have brought out a Wall of Illusion or a Lodge in to try and block. But we figure we're getting the Aquamator back at the end of the turn anyways. We don't need two monsters on board. So we're just going to do this. We get the Aquamator back at the end of the turn. Mayor Bug is a great draw when we have Ultimate Offering. We're going to try and hit in to the Maneater Bug with the Alchemador because we do have a Wall of Illusion in hand that we would like to bring out at some point. Uh, and if we do bring out the Wall of Illusion, then they could just attack into it with the Maneater Bug, and we don't want that to happen. So we are just going to do that. Sure, it does make our Alchemador a bit vulnerable, but we do have Defenders in hand to back it up. They're going to attack in with Giant Soldier. They're going to try attacking in with Aquamador. We are going to pay five, set the wall, and that will bounce their Aquamador back to hand. They'll take 650 from that. They're going to set two and pass back to us. 
We're just going to set one pass back to them. We're feeling pretty good here. They're going to bring out Neo. We're just going to trap hole it. Uh, but they do reveal that they're on last will as they were last game. And they are playing the Wicked Worm Beast here. And it looks like, you know, they're going to last will again. And they do a very clever play. They bring out a Man Eater Bug from deck. And this is very clever because this means that they can bounce back the Man Eater Bug to hand. Essentially get a free removal spell off of our Wall of Illusion. So I think that was a very clever play. And they will flip up an Aquamator as well. We're going to take 1400 from the Man Eater Bug attack. But it looks like they probably have like a reinforcements or something here to get over the wall. And they'll try attacking in for a bit more. We are going to pay 5. And I think we're considering here was try bringing out the Lodgen or try bringing out the Man Eater Bug. We're just going to bring out the Bug. Uh, pop the Aquamator. They're going to set one pass back to us. We're, we're going to bring out the Lodge in, try and bait something. Uh, we could have chain blocked it with Ultimate Offering, but honestly, you know, we don't care too, too much. Uh, I, actually, it, it could have potentially been for the best because they've already used up some defenders, so they might not have another in hand, so. Uh, and it would enable us to clear the Giant Soldier, but they're just going to trap hole. We're going to activate swords and pass back to them. They're going to pass back to us. Pot of Greed is a pretty good draw here. we able to draw two more and pass back to them. They're going to set another pass back to us. We have seven cards, so we're just going to discard this extra ultimate offering. They're going to bring out Neo. We're fine with that. Swords will expire. We've got plenty of defenders now, though, so we're feeling very good about our hand now. We're just going to set a defender because if they do manage to clear it, you know, we've got other defenders in hand. They're going to bring out Wicked Worm Beast. They're going to write Gekki away, our one defender, which feels very good for us. Just another form of removal that's gone. And they're going to try and get in. We're going to pay five, bring out Maneater Bug, uh, just to pop that Wicked Worm Beast, which could cause us trouble later on. And we're going to pay another five to bring out Spirit of the Harp. A third piece of Exodia is great. All we need are two more, and we'll be feeling pretty fine. They're going to tribute out a Summon Skull. Kind of unfortunate. We were kind of hoping that they weren't on this card, but they'll attack in to the Spirit of the Harp, and I'll attack directly with Neo. We will just take it. The reason for that is, you know, we do have a Dark Hole to clear their board. We have a Swords to replenish our hand for Defenders. And we, you know, have a Boku if things go really south. So we're okay taking 17 to enable us to keep a defender in hand and dark hold their board. Man Eater Bug is a great draw here. Uh, we're still going to dark hole, although there was the option to just set the Man Eater Bug to pop that summon skill. But I think dark hole is the better option. They're going to bring out a giant soldier, try and attack in. We're going to pay five, bring out and Aquamator, and they're just not even going to attack it. I think that's smart. They're at very low life points. Even though we are clearly playing some form of a stall deck, you know, we could just potentially, if their life points get low enough, just kill them out of nowhere with an offensive push. So I think it makes sense to do that. We're just going to pass back to them, drawing another defender. They're going to dark hole this board, which shows that they're in desperate need of removal. They're going to bring out a lodge in, try and attack in. We're going to pay five. We're going to bring out a defender here. And they're not going to be able to clear that. They're going to take two, pass back to us. We draw Wall of Illusion. Great drawing another defender. But at the same time, you know, with the Man Eater Bug that we know they have in hand, it's less good. We're just going to set it because they've gotten rid of their mass board removal here. And, you know, they could do the whole set Man Eater Bug, flip up Man Eater Bug, pop our Giant Soldier, attack into the wall, get it back, back to hand. But they're very, very low on life points. So if they do that, we might actually manage to win through damage. So honestly, we don't mind if they do that. They're going to Swords, just see what we got. Set another pass back to us. We figure that's probably a Man Eater bug. Um, so we're just going to set another, you know. Uh, this way, if they have like a Fisher, they can't just get in for a bunch of damage. And we are running low on Ultimate Offering uh, activations. So we're fine doing this. They're going to Fisher away our 
wall, they're going to fisher away our giant soldier. They're going to reveal that they're not actually on a manure there, they're on a lodge-in. They're probably trying to bluff us into using like a change of heart or something on that. Uh, they're going to reinforcements to get over it. We're going to pay five, set a man-eater, pop one of their monsters, and they're just going to set another set another pass back to us. We figure that's very likely to be a man-eater bug, so we are just going to flip Swords Revealing Light here. Turns out that they were bluffing us again, so nothing we can really do about that. We're just going to pass because we do know that they have a man-eater bug in hand, so if we do bring out Mystical Elf, they can just pop it that way. And we're under swords, so there's no real pressure. We're going to set the monster reborn, just in case if they're on card destruction, you know, we want to keep the monster reborn to potentially make plays later on. Um, because they are very low on life points, so we could just kill them here, potentially. We're going to reborn back the summon skull. We're going to attack in to the lodge in. We could get greedy here, Raigeki their board, summon out Mystical Elf, and try attacking in for everything. But we want to save the Raigeki for when they likely set Maneater Bug. They're going to Woboku. We're just going to set one. Pass back to them. They are going to set two. Pass back to us. We figure that's very likely to be the Maneater Bug. So uh, the sword is gone. Uh, we forgot to get rid of it. Uh, we're going to Raigeki their board away. And try and attack in for game here. They have Woboku. And they also revealed that they did just set a bluff there. Uh, it was very clever of them to do that. Uh, this makes it much less likely that we'll be able to assemble lethal because they can just, you know, set Maneater to pop our Summon Skull. They're going to bring out Battle Ox and they're going to try and just attack into the Mystical Elf because we are at very low life points here. If they do have two reinforcements, then this will lose us the game. Uh, however, they've used up two reinforcements already, so they can't actually have that. So, we're not at risk of dying here, but that will drop us lower than we might like. So, what we are going to do is we're actually going to Woboku here, uh, after thinking a lot about it. Because, this way, we've got the Fissure in hand, so we can still threaten Lethal next turn. If we attack with Summon Skull first, and they don't Woboku, then that means we can just attack with the Mystical Elf afterwards. Get in for game. Uh, and... That might be what we're trying to do here. We'll, we'll have to decide. Uh, I think we're in a good spot if we just want to go for Exodia. Uh, just win that way. But the thing is... Oh, Trap Hole is very good. So that just, you know, gives us more insulation here. Uh, they haven't used up a Reborn. They've used up Change of Heart, though. So they won't be able to take Summon Skull. So if they have a Reborn and they have Woboku and we fish away their battle lock to attack him with Summon Skull. They take it to go, to go at us into declaring an attack with Mystical Elf. Then they will Boku. We could just lose the game out of Hubris here. But let's see what happens. We're going to fish away their battle locks, and they're just going to emit defeat. They do have a Monster Reborn, but they don't have a Woboku. Um, looks like they also don't have like a Summon Skull or something in Grave. So actually they... They do have a man your bug, but no, they, they wouldn't have been able to actually get Summon Skull and Grave, bring it back, and clear Mystical Elf. So, uh, we were actually safe, but we probably should have played it better safe than sorry. But, uh, we managed to win through Aggression. So, we figure, you know, normally after playing Exodia in a game, you side out of it for the next game. Because you figure the opponent knows what you're on now, they can just side in card destruction and things like that. Um, here, we didn't actually win through Exodia, so we just keep the Exodia deck in. Uh, you could argue that this was a bit greedy because they see that we're on a more stall-y deck, uh, game two, and also, you know, being a bit meta, uh, they know about my YouTube channel, they know that I've been covering Exodia for the past couple games, uh, so they could likely have the read that I was on Exodia and didn't pull off that win condition. We're going to keep Exodia, though, in the deck. Uh, makes for more entertaining content. So, we're just going to go with this. Uh, we're going to keep this side deck, you know, everything the same that we did there. And we're starting off with one piece. And 
No other monsters, which is kind of rough, but we do have other stall tools, so not the worst. They're gonna set three and pass. We draw another piece. Not the best here, but not the worst. We make a slight misplay here because uh, we should have just sort of been lighted first in case that was like a trap master. Uh, the reason we didn't is we were actually debating not doing the swords at all, and we knew that we were setting the Woboku no matter what. So we did this first. Uh, that's not how you should play things in general. In general, you should decide on your game plan first and then follow through with it instead of just buying time while you're thinking about your game plan and making these other plays. Uh, it was unlikely that that was a trap master because, you know, if we were on a more aggressive strategy, we could just attack into it and with no backer, they'd have to pop one of their own. But it's better safe than sorry, so uh, just, just something to keep in mind for the future. We're going to set one pass back to them. Trap holes a great draw here. Uh, they'll pass back to us. Woboku is a, another pretty good draw, but we already have one on field, so we don't really need it. They're going to set another pass back to us. We finally draw a monster that we can bring out. So we're just going to bring it out, set the Fisher pass back to them. They're going to soul exchange our monster, revealing that they are on a soul exchange strategy. You know, this does play against Exodia a bit better, so kind of unfortunate. Uh, we will just dark hole their board away though. Set another pass back to them. They're going to dark hole our monster away. We're just going to trap hole their Neo. Uh, and Pot of Greed's very good. And we do draw into another defender, which is very nice. So we'll be able to set that defender pass back to them. They're going to bring out Aquamador, attack into our Wall of Illusion. It's just Wall of Illusion, so they're going to take 650. They're going to pass back to us. Fisher, not the best draw, but also not the worst. They're going to bring out Aquamador. That's fine. And they're going to Fisher away our monster. Attack in for 12. We're going to take it. They'll pass back to us. We draw a Giant Soldier of Stone, so that's very nice. We just set it and pass back to them. Uh, in hindsight, we could have potentially just Fishered their monster away uh, to prevent them from, like, tributing over it or something like that. But we figured we want to save the Fisher for when they actually have a bigger threat on board because they are playing soul control. Sure, there are ways to play around Fisher, but oftentimes it's tough to maneuver yourself into those positions. So saving the Fisher for a bigger monster, I think, is a very valid play, but it's a bit of a risk if they have any way to clear this giant soldier of stone. We do have three Wobokus, though, you know, on field and in hand, so not the worst risk in the world. They're going to bring out Lodge in, and they are just going to attack into our set here. Uh, we're going to think about it a bit. We are just going to preemptively Oboku because, you know, if they do have reinforcements, they can get in for 12. This way, we can fisher away their board. Uh, I, I mean, this is a bit of... I don't know. I, I'm i not sure how I feel about this play in hindsight. I think I probably should have saved the Oboku in case they didn't have reinforcements. Uh, this is a bit greedy on my part. I'm like, I really don't want to take that 1,200 damage. So I can Fisher away their monster next turn. I, you know, I think this was a bit too greedy on my part. Pass back to us. We draw Raigeki, which is very nice. We could just use it here. I think that's what we're debating doing. Instead, we're just going to double Fisher away their board, set one, pass back to them. Uh, you know, they're going to set one, pass back to us. A third piece is pretty good to see because we do have defensive options on board, but I think we would have preferred something else there. They're going to bring out a Lodge in, flip up an Aquamador, Fisher away our giant soldier, and we will be forced to use a Woboku here, pass back. Uh, we're just going to set Manier, set a Woboku, and they are just going to attack in here. We are going to pop the Aquamador. You could argue maybe we should have just popped the Lodge in. But we're getting very greedy on damage. We don't want to take any of it. Uh, we're going to set an Aquamador. They're going to attack in. And they're just going to take two. So that reveals that they didn't have reinforcements earlier. So the Woboku was a very greedy play. And I think it was actually the wrong play to make at that point. Uh, Reborn ain't bad. Uh, we can potentially Reborn back. There's some Skull. Attack in to clear the Lodge in. And that's what we're going to do. I think this may be also just be a bit too greedy, but we're going to go for it. And they do Woboku here. 
they're going to bring out an Aquamador, and they will just write Geki away our board. That's why the Monster Reborn play was a bit greedy. We are forced to Woboku this. They're going to set one pass back to us. Swords is a great draw here. We're just going to Swords pass back to them. They're going to switch the Aquamador to defense, pass back to us. We're just going to draw Man Eater. We don't need to use it yet, especially knowing that they're on a Soul Control sort of strategy. We're going to set the Spirit of the Harp, trying to bait them a bit into using up a Soul Control card, uh, committing another monster to the board that we can then Raigeki. Uh, we're going to set another because they've used up Raigeki and Dark Hole, so we don't really fear that as much. And if they do use Soul Exchange or Change of Heart or something, you know, we do have Raigeki. They're going to attack into Aquamador, take two. They're going to attack into the Spirit of the Harp take eight and they're going to pass back to us ultimate offering great draw here um they're going to soul exchange away our Akumador, summon out a summon skull and this is perfect for us we get to raigeki a great board there set a fisher pass back to them they're just going to set two pass back to us and we draw another defender uh we pass back to them i think this is a mistake i think we should just set out the Aquamator, uh, because again, they've used up all their board removal. Uh, I guess change of heart would make it rough, but we do have the man -eater bug in hand. I don't know, I think I should just set the Aquamator, but you know, we've got ultimate offering on field, so it's not like we really need to worry about that too much. They're going to attack in to the Spirit of the Harp with the Battle Ox. We're just going to bring out a, uh, you know, Bringing a monster with the ultimate offering. There was a bit of lag there, so it was quite. It was a little unclear what we were doing to them, but uh, we clarified in the chat section there. They've got another reinforcement as well, so they'll be able to clear both of our defenders. But we're feeling pretty good because they've used up two reinforcements so far, and we do have another defender in hand. So we are just going to pass back to them. This might be a bit greedy. Uh, I think we're playing around like Soul Exchange, but uh, we are just going to set a spirit of the harp they'll use a reinforcement to get over that we're going to pay five they're going to attack in and we're just going to pop the lodge in they're going to bring out a giant soldier pass back to us and that fourth piece is not what we wanted at all we're in a very very precarious position here ah we really needed any other defender besides that but you know we can potentially survive another turn we'll fisher away their giant soldier and, you know, next turn, we are probably going to draw either a Defender or an Exodia piece. Uh, so if we can just survive this turn, we should be okay. Hopefully. Unless they have Reborn. So they are able to get back Summon's Skull, and they are able to attack in for 4,200 here. This is really bad for us because if we draw a Defender, you know, they can just get around it. So... I think that we've likely lost the game. We do, oh no, Dark Hole and Raigeki are both gone. All our Wobokus are gone. Yeah, it's a really, it, it's tough. I don't, you know, we really just need to draw that last Exodia piece. Can we do it? Ah, no, we can't. So that will likely be the end of the game. They just have to attack in here, and that is what they do. So, you know, we did lose this match, but also I think I made some pretty significant misplays in this last game here with that Woboku. Uh, we could have potentially stalled for a bit longer. Maybe if we had saved the Monster Reborn, uh, they wouldn't have been able to clear the Summon Skull. We could have used it to clear a bit more of their beaters. Eh, it's, it's tough to say exactly what would have happened here. But I do think that this was a much more competitive match than some of the previous Exodia matches that have shown off the, on the channel were. And, you know, we did get four pieces in hand. And talking to them afterwards, uh, they did reveal that they guessed that we were on Exodia for game two and three. So, you know, that could have, you know, influenced their side decking for game three. Whereas if it was more of a surprise, maybe they would have Decided a bit differently here. You know, they could have probably guessed that we were on an Exodia smokescreen just from how we played game two. But 
you know, if we had caught them more by surprise, maybe we could have won this one. Or if we had just sided into the more standard soul control deck that we had in game one, we could have also potentially taken it. Uh, well, it looks like they're still on trap hole. So they were prepared for a bit more of an aggressive strategy as well. But uh, I, I don't know. I think it was a very, very close match. And I think, you know, we made some plays that if we had played it differently, we could have potentially won. And I have seen this deck win other games. Like Oreki, the original pilot of this deck, the creator of this deck, I've seen them win games pretty handily with it. And this was my first time playing it, so it could just be down to a skill issue largely. But I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, this will actually be my last Exodia video for a while. I'm putting my foot down. Uh, I thought this was a very, very cool deck, and I thought it was a vast improvement over some of the other Exodia decks I've shown off on the channel. So I wanted to make a video showing it off and giving the credit to a recce where the credit is due because I think that they came up with a very innovative take on the deck that is probably the best version of it. But I'm kind of tired of playing Exodia for a while. I've been playing the deck for a while now uh, to make these past couple of videos. So I'm gonna play something fairly different for my next couple. If you like this sort of content, please consider liking and subscribing. As of recording, and you know, this might change by the time I upload this, as of recording, I'm at 68 subscribers. Uh, would really like to hit the 69 subscriber milestone. It would be a really nice milestone to reach. Uh, and you know, if you're my 69th subscriber, you have the pride of being able to say that you were my 69th subscriber. Uh, and I'm sure some of you will likely take great pleasure in that. So definitely consider subscribing. But until next time, I've been Ben from YGO From Zero, and I'm signing off.